Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session 14 of the European Health Forum uh, Gestein, Health Democracy in Action. We will we have a great speaker lineup for you today. Uh, my name is Deepa Rajan, and um, our moderator today will be Matthias Wismar. This session will be organized uh, as uh, the following. We will start with an introduction by Natasha Azupadi Muscat of the WHO Regional Office for Europe, and then we will hand back to our moderator, Matthias, for um, uh, the rest of the session, which will then continue with the keynote by myself to frame the key messages of the session, after which we'll have an exciting country panel where we're here from Thailand, from Portugal, and from France. And then we'll have a closing by Anya Sukat of the World Health Organization headquarters. So I'm going to hand over now to our moderator, Matthias, and off we go. Thank you so much, Deepa. My name is Matthias Wismar from the European Observatory, and I have today the honor and pleasure to guide you through the program and to facilitate the panel discussion. But before we do this, we hear welcome from Natasha Asopadi Muskas, Divisional Director at WHO Euro, and that will be followed by a keynote by Deepa Rajan. Natasha, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you, Deepa. Good morning. It's very nice to see you all on this, uh, our third day of the virtual European Health Forum Gastein. And what an important topic to be discussing, health democracy in action. Of course, I understand that a lot of the work that is going to be discussed today actually has been ongoing for a while and even uh, predated the COVID uh, pandemic. And yet I think if there was any lingering doubt as to why it is so important to enable um, the right institutional frameworks, mechanisms and processes to engage society in place, I'm sure that everyone now after the recent months has totally converted to the importance of ensuring that we do have the appropriate systems, structures, policy, in place in order to draw upon them, particularly in the times of greatest need. Of course, the European um, region provides a very interesting laboratory because of its uh, diverse array of experiences. And today you will be hearing from two countries, France, which has a relatively um, long standing experience and Portugal, which has carried out some rather innovative initiatives in recent years. And I think uh, perhaps if you will allow me, Matthias, I would just like to link this important area of work to one of the four flagship areas of the European programme of work for the next five years. And this is the flagship area of behavioural and cultural insights. I think it's become um, of paramount importance to establish the appropriate channels and mechanisms to be listening to people all the time and to be understanding how to work through and with civil society and other organizations in order to ensure that the health policies that are being implemented, the health services that are being designed are very much owned by the people um, and very much reflect not only the needs, we tend to be very much epidemiologically driven, but we know that when we talk about needs, we have to go beyond epidemiological needs, and we need to understand also people's aspirations, people's desires. Perhaps I may they dare say use the term people's wants too, because it is only in this way that we will be able to ensure that we advance health by bringing people on board and people with us. And I think that one of the buzzwords at the moment, which we need to make sure is far more than a buzzword, has been resilience and health systems resilience. And we are trying to understand what contributes to this resilience. And what we find is that it is not enough to use matrices such as health security preparedness, such as universal health coverage, because of course, there is the social capital and the societal resilience. And then the final point, um, we need to understand how important it is that we engage with um, uh, civil society and with partners and with people, even those who are not organized and who are harder to reach, 
because this is part and parcel of the democratic expression, which again in the European region, we like to say that we have a very strong tradition, centuries old, and at this point in time, health is one of those channels that can allow us to even strengthen democracy going forward. And I think in this critical period, the workshop that you have organized this morning is really going to be an important and refreshing session to help us really understand that this is not something theoretical. It's not about um, a whole of society approach. We've moved on from that and it's about how do we actually implement and get people to engage with us on the ground and how do we in turn respond to people's needs and aspirations. Back to you, Matthias, and I'm looking forward to hearing presentations. Natasha, thank you so much. We are more than happy to have you on board because actually you are the role model for this workshop. You've been until recently before you joined uh, WHO, a senior government official. And at the same time, you were the president of uh, UFA, the European Public Health Association. So you know it from both sides. And that's the philosophy today, a little bit of this workshop. We want to look at the issue from both sides, from the government side and from the civil society side and to discuss about the interface and context conducive to working together. Thank you so much and greetings to Copenhagen. Bye. And now I hand over to my colleague Deepa for the keynote that gives us a little bit of a flavor of the topic we are talking about and mm -hmm. provides us some common language and common ideas and concepts. Please Deepa, go ahead. Thank you, Matthias. So as you just heard from uh, Natasha, and as COVID-19 indeed is demonstrating to us all as we speak, the way forward for health systems and for health governance is about finding a way to systematically and meaningfully engaging populations, communities, and civil society into health policy and health decision-making. It's at the core, as Natasha also said, of resilience, of responsiveness, and of people-centered health systems. So this sounds good in theory, but also, as Natasha underlined, now we need to get to the practice of it. And you'll be hearing this morning from three countries, from Portugal and France, from the European region, and, and Thailand from beyond the European region. And what you'll be hearing from them is that in practice, it's not easy. In practice, we see both governments and civil society and community groups struggling with that how of participation. And in practice, it is complex and sometimes complicated. And unfortunately, not everyone is always convinced that it's truly needed and that it will bear fruit. But what we'd like to make the case for you today, through the examples here on your screen, you see Portugal to your left, in the middle, the National Health Assembly of Thailand on the right. Uh, this was a recent large-scale public consultation on bioethical matters in France in 2018. And we'd like to show you that it does bear fruit. It is worth investing in, with all its limitations and difficulties, of course. And it's worth investing in those mechanisms for governments, for decision makers, budget holders, policy makers, all of these people to dialogue on a continuous and regular basis with populations, with communities and with civil society. And in a few minutes, we'll hear, for example, from Thailand, how investing in their National Health Assembly process for over two decades has now actually produced a national public good, not without its flaws and challenges, but nevertheless, the, those links to communities that were built up over many, many years were have proven to be hugely beneficial during the COVID response. So perhaps we need to also acknowledge that it really does take that long. It takes a few years to invest in trust and in relationships and a participatory system, which is fair, but also policy relevant and responsive. And it's something that we need to do with a much longer term vision in mind, because these things are not built overnight. But if they're present, they can be hugely leveraged during the uh, emergency responses uh, such as COVID. And we'll be hearing about that more in this session. But I'd like to give you a bit of a reality check on what actually happened during COVID and in terms of linkages to communities and to civil society. And several papers have come out on the topic um, and, and are basically adding to the growing body of evidence on the disconnect, unfortunately, between community and civil society responses and 
the government response to COVID. And here we've picked out uh, three articles that sort of summarize uh, the gist of what all of the articles are saying. One of them from ourselves, actually, which you see on the top left, which is a, a an analysis of about 25 COVID task force decision-making bodies. And the follow-up article just came out today, this morning actually, where we looked at a hundred of them. So these are really based on, these in findings are based on uh, a quite large scale analysis. So this article from the Lancet basically laments the fact that participation is unfortunately seen as an added extra rather than really fundamental to the COVID response. Um, the, uh, the authors remind us here that um, the emphasis actually given in various national guidelines and global health guidelines on community participation, but in contrast, the pandemic response have has, and I quote, largely involved governments telling communities what to do, seemingly with minimal community input. And the article goes on to really uh, give some very nice examples of how communities have been uh, and can be used to identify solutions, to uh, counter stigma, to increase adherence to measures, to uh, pro provide insight into structural barriers to adhering to measures, etc. Um, another article in the BMJ also underlined the statutory policy commitments that um, are involved uh, that are there, but were unfortunately, and I quote, abandoned during the COVID-19 response. And the excuse that was often given, or the justification, was that decisions needed to be made fast. So when decisions need to be made fast, what happened uh, is that the expertise that's, that's rooted in lived experiences in how people feel and think, and as Natasha said, what they want is cast aside. Civil society is left out of expert committees. This is sort of an expression of this. And the result is really the fact that we lose out on the chance to really mitigate predictable adverse effects of, for in COVID, the massive service reconfiguration that happened. And uh, we lose out on the chance to reduce morbidity and mortality, uh, lose out on the chance to reduce the anxiety and the helplessness that led to very low service demand during the COVID crisis. And so I'd like to give you four key messages based on what I just said, and also based on our own analysis of almost 100 task forces, that um, I think these messages will, ref will come out again, definitely in the country panel. And I'd like us to really ruminate on it and, um, and hopefully collectively try to find some solutions for it. Firstly, what we see is that evidence is still largely understood as science, as research-based hard evidence. And while this is hugely important, and we know that there are countries that are neglecting even that, we need to equally value experiential implementation-based evidence from the field, especially when the implementation is at the core, at the response is at the core of being able to address the health problem at hand. The majority of COVID-19 task force memberships are clearly experts and researchers from reputed universities and government institutes largely leaving out other types of expertise. Secondly, um, even amongst the experts, we are casting our net very narrowly. What we saw in the COVID response, and here's an example you see on your screen from Belgium, is that mainly the super specialist experts, the virologists, the epidemiologist modelers were consulted first. And as an afterthought, much later in, in the response, other health and also non-health experts came in. So we, we are viewing health not from the point of view of people, not in a holistic way. So other health experts such as mental health professionals, child health professionals came in really as an afterthought. And uh, not to mention the non-health experts, the social scientists, the social workers who are working with those elderly who we were trying so hard as a society to protect. So our default governance mode is to not cast the net broadly and to not speak with the with those who are really involved and with the health problem at hand. And why is this? Partly, I'd, we'd like to make the case, uh, and I hope that that message comes across in the panel today, is that it's because we don't have the mechanisms to cast our net more widely. We are used to, in an emergency mode, to quickly, in a knee-jerk reaction, 
reach out to those few experts and to have closed door sessions and make decisions. Whereas what we need are mechanisms that allow us to reach out to a wide group of experts and society, people, communities, and civil society. So we need those mechanisms because those relationships and relationships of trust are very difficult to build during in the emergency mode. These need to be built up as a modus operandi of the health system to then be activated and used during the emergency response. Third key message is that because there's such a disconnect between the government response and the civil society response, we see that they acted in the COVID uh, situation quite independently of each other. There's very little connection to what civil society was doing, and they were doing a lot, as we know, and the response that govern, uh, governments were doing um, in many countries. Um, a recent survey conducted by the UHC 2030 Alliance, Universal Health Coverage 2030, um, had over 200 civil society organizations responding and from uh, about almost 60 countries. And basically, you know, the bottom line finding was that the government had not really um, provided an opportunity for community groups and civil society to connect with them during the COVID response. And, and that they felt that this led to human rights violations, that it led to lower adherence to, to COVID measures, to negative impacts of the COVID response efforts. In the few subset of countries where CSOs were very much involved with the government response. They reported a more coordinated response. They re re reported better risk communication. Uh, they reported much more inclusivity of different sectors of the community into the response. So they really pushed for that, you know, that inclusivity by the very fact of, of interacting with each other. There was uh, the the net was cast more broadly, so to speak. And finally. I'd like to leave you with this, is that we do need more transparency to better understand how decisions are made, who's making those decisions, who's being consulted, whose points of view are being taken into consideration or not. And this is, uh, you know, and this is important, not just for, for trust in the system and trust in government, but also to be able to ensure that the, cast is net, uh, the net is cast as widely as possible. And remember that transparency and trust, they do not open, happen open, overnight. We do need a, a participatory governance culture and that underlying that is really regularized and institutionalized mechanisms like you'll be hearing from in, in the next uh, hour, like in Portugal or like in Thailand, where you, people, communities, civil society, government cadres have more opportunity to interact with each other, more exposure to each other. And these, this investment in those participatory spaces can really re reap huge dividends in times of crisis. And you'll be hearing more about that in uh, the next uh, 60 minutes. And so I leave you with that. Thank you very much. And right now we're going to move to a short polling activity. And so back to you, Matthias. Deepa, thank you so much. That was an excellent um, presentation, very rich, lots of stuff to um, uh, follow up. And you also managed to keep within your time budget, which is today really a challenge because we have so many excellent speakers, but uh, we want also the, the public to participate because here it's all about participation and we want to have feedback from you. So please use the chat function of the system and send us your messages and my colleague Kira will later on feed them back to the um, panel. Deepa, I heard a lot of very important work like, words like, for example, it takes years and decades to build actually trust and um, relationships. You also said it's a bit of an investment. And I think you said that trust goes both ways. You need trust to develop relationships between civil society and government, but also vice versa. If you once have it, if you have this relationship, that creates trust itself. And that is quite essential, especially in times of um, COVID-19 crisis and other major issues. And you had four very good key messages that civil society is a bit left behind now, actually, in this COVID-19 crisis, that the expert consultations are a um, bit dominated by virologists and uh, modelers, and um, others came into the picture only later, like, for example, um, health professions, uh, informal carers, citizens, and so on. And unfortunately, I think some countries have paid a high price for this. 
and there was a little connection between governance and society. So uh, civil society was working on it, but uh, um, uh, independently. And the other one, and I think that is very important, especially with regards to the times of fake news and populism, transparency is key. We need to see that transparency is, is really a given that everybody can rely on. So thank you very much for this excellent presentation. And I think we are now going to the poll. Is it already working, Kira? Yes, Matthias, I can see the polls and they should be opening up now. OK, so please, everybody go to the poll. Um, make your choices. It's just a couple of um, questions. So I think we are waiting for the results later on. Um, I get the strange messages here from the poll, actually. I hope it's working. Um, as I said before, um, this session, this um, uh, panel session, has been designed to bring together both sides of the, of the activity um, the government and civil society leader, people who are working really at the at the interface, you know, talking about their work, their connections, but also the context conducive to their work, what makes them, uh, so what, what really does support them. And my challenge is here to introduce all the speakers and um, they have all actually very long and very distinguished careers in many, many um, uh, positions. And I would fail, I would fail if I start, I would, really like all of you to have a look at the CVs and I am asking the speakers to very briefly, very briefly refer to their actually um, function which they are currently um, exerting with regards to um, civil society and uh, government and um, participation and democracy. So our first speaker, our first speaker is uh, Nanut from uh, Thailand and Nanut you have been actually active in the um, health commission and you know what um deepa asked me Matthias, you need to ask nanut something about the triangle is moving mountains so um, i don't really know what it means but after that i would actually want you to explain us a little bit you know um how social participation is anchored in the thai system and um, how the Thai government is actually trying to reach out to communities. But please tell us about the mountain first and the triangle, <laughs> and uh, then the two questions. Please, Nanut, the floor Thank is you. Good, And I give you a sign with regarding to the time. Thank you. But first of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting Thailand to present here, which we are have different contexts from European, but it's nice to share among different contexts. A triangle that moves the mountain uh, means the synergy of tri power, authority power from government, knowledge power from academia, and social power from community, civil society, NGOs, and private sector. And we use this strategy to reform health system. And we make sure that this strategy can make the society move forward and can tackle complicated problems like COVID-19 as well. So um, many health organizations in Thailand apply this strategy. For example, my organization, we have National Health Commission chaired by the Prime Minister, but the composition of the members are from three sectors, 13 seats equally. And this strategy also applies to organizing National Health Assembly. This assembly is adapted from, from World Health Assembly, but the difference between two assemblies is the constituencies. In Thailand, NGO, civil society, academia, and uh, private sector has, has a say in that assembly. So institutionally, culturally, we have adopted this strategy and this strategy gives importance to social participation. And civil society can push the agenda to National Health Assembly as well. So when we have crisis, COVID-19 crisis, we apply this strategy to, uh, to 
to cope with this problem. But at the beginning, we don't use, this is not the first strategy. The first strategy, we use the command, central command from the prime minister and as DPA study, uh, mostly are uh, from health professional. And uh, the government issues emergency decree and many public health measures like lockdown, state quarantines, self-isolation, temporary business closures. These are effective measures, but frankly, it's hard to comply with. And it cannot be done successfully without social participation. Uh, at the beginning, uh, at the beginning of the outbreak, when nurses and health volunteers visited any houses, there is a rumor in that community that at that house there must be someone have COVID nineteen positive like that. And even though we have uh, a media briefing every day, but even though it's this useful, but it's a one-way communication. People in general, especially one who living in a community, cannot ask or raise a questions. So that's why my organizations come in, aiming to build trust between the government and the public, to make better public understanding and adaptation to a new normal. And lastly, to make government measures more effective. So we launched a project in collaboration with many sectors like Ministry of Public Health, Ministry of Interior, Community-Based Development Institute, Thai Public Broadcast Service. This is to name but a few, to encourage a community in all provinces to, to share information where the vulnerable groups are where resources, where social capitals in the community, let them discuss their problems and how and how to deal with COVID nineteen situation based on their context, and put all their agree interventions in a community health charter. So this is so called a social contract, not a government order, a community health charter. And during discussion and consultation in communities, a second uh, image, please. During discussion and consultation in communities, the triangle moves the mountain uh, strategy is applied. So not only community members talk among themselves, but at least local government officer, public health officers should be there. Uh, I hope you can see a man in that picture, the man with the white T-shirt. He is a public health officer from Bangkok Metropolitan Administration. So actually you can talk everywhere and you can plan everywhere. And at that time, informal approach is the best. And community intervention are really practical and creative. I can give you a few examples. One is uh, during a lockdown and we need a local quarantine, uh, some community use a temple area as a local quarantine and they agree to build a community kitchen in a temple. So uh, villagers come to cook food for people living in the quarantine and as well as distribute food to affected people. And this is the, the context of rural area. In the context of urban area like Bangkok, they arrange a food delivery service. By them, The food is cooked by themselves, uh, not ordered from Starbucks or McDonald's, and they employ local motorcycle taxi drivers to service co customers in a community. So this is to boost economy and help people unemployed. So uh, government can give an outline, but community will go into detail how to implement it. Uh, my next slide. Oh, my you next still image. Have one more minute, Manut. Yes, my so simply I would like before I end my talk for now. 
uh, I think everyone has equal responsibility and accountability to society and COVID-19. And we should get community engaged in decision making and not only hear their voice, but let them work together with the government at the beginning. That's my point. Thank you. Nanu, thank you so much. Um, and um, I think the, um, the mountain moves, the triangle moves the mountain is a very nice metaphor. I really like the three points and it we can relate quite a lot, you know, uh, the evidence, the politics and the social engagement. It was also very interesting to see that um, the government is reaching out really systematically towards communities and the communities are, of course, very different. They are different in in uh, rural areas from urban areas, but that they all had a very important role actually in uh, responding to the COVID-19 crisis. I think your presentation has given us a lot of uh, additional uh, concrete uh, insights into it. And uh, I'm, I guess we will uh, follow up this with um, some discussion. Now, thank you, our, thank you so much, Nanud. Our second speaker is Jean-Francois Delfrecy. And as I said before, if I read out the CVs of all the distinguished colleagues uh, now joining us, I would uh, consume all the, all the time. All I want to say at this um, moment, Jean-Francois, is that you are, amongst others, the chairman of the National Consultative Ethics Committee. And actually, you have requested civil society um, uh, in, in involvement. And um, I, I wanted to know, you are a professor, you are coming from the science, and we very often hear that science is a little bit reluctant to include um, social participation, civil society leaders, citizens. Uh, what do you do to overcome uh, barriers in this uh, dialogue between citizens, science, and uh, government? Please, Jean-Francois, the floor is all yours. I need to remind you of the eight minutes because we have a very dense uh, program. So, but please go ahead. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Or I, I don't know. It's very good morning. It's a good word for for some of you. Uh, so, uh, I, as you say, uh, I, I am the president of the National Ethical Committee, but uh, in the past I've been uh, fully involved in uh, emerging infectious disease and uh, in, uh, in HIV, uh, ARA, etc. So, I've been nominated uh, at the beginning of March uh, by the president of the uh, French Republic, uh, Emmanuel Macron, as the president of a scientific committee directly involved uh, to, to give uh, some idea and uh, some opinion uh, on, on the crisis, on the COVID-19 uh, crisis, uh, directly to, to, to the president and uh, the French president and, and the prime minister. So uh, during that time and during the last six, six, six months, I've stopped my, my role as the president of the National Ethical Committee, and I have been fully involved in operational uh, uh, issues uh, to to help and uh, to give some uh, uh, ID and uh, etc uh, directly uh, with uh, uh, with the politics the French politician. Uh, you you some of you probably remember that uh, the uh, National Ethical Committee have been uh, fully involved uh, two years ago in a, a national uh, consultation on the uh, ethical uh, issue and uh, before. Uh, a, a new law in France, because we have a, a biotic law every uh, uh, six years, approximately. And uh, for the first time, uh, two years ago, the, the National Ethical Committee, the CCNA, uh, have been involved to organize uh, a large consultation in France on uh, different uh, ethical issues, on the uh, biological and, and new uh, and new uh, data, information on genomics, etc., etc. And you remember that we have discussed uh, uh, that uh, one year ago to all together. So uh, the, when uh, I, I took the presence of uh, uh, the, the COVID-19 committee, I, I was as a big, since the beginning uh, with the idea uh, that uh, uh, the, the global response uh, have to should involve. Uh, not only scientists and the physician, uh, politician too, but also uh, the, the citizen uh, and the representative of citizen. 
Uh, our committee is composed of uh, uh, 12 people, uh, of 12 scientists, not only virologists, but also uh, uh, people coming from uh, human and social science. And uh, I, I decide on the general composition of, an, uh, of, uh, of the committee. Uh, so a multidisciplinary approach with uh, one representative of uh, NGOs uh, who is uh, at the head of NGO involved in France in uh, precarity. So uh, since the beginning, uh, this, uh, the position of, uh, of the citizen has been for me a priority. Uh, and uh, in, the, in, the next, uh, in the next minute, I, I explain to you finally that uh, it does not work uh, so really well. And so there is a contrast between uh, finally a, a good expertise in France uh, to involve uh, the civil society, uh, for example, in the biotic law. And at that time, in the COVID-19, we have uh, some, some problems that I want to discuss with you. So the, the, the COVID-19 uh, scientific committee uh, took a, a, is not a, an operational committee, but uh, it, it gives some information and some guidelines to directly to, to the French president. We have been involved in the decision of the lockdown, but also uh, uh, at the end of the lockdown. And now we are, uh, for example, in July, we, we, we have uh, some notes and, uh, and some uh, 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 and some uh, issues, uh, and we have we have said in July that probably we we will have a second wave in France and in Europe in general uh, at the end of September, and that uh, the the, promise, the major issue will be uh, in big cities and not in in the whole country, but uh, in uh, in uh, big cities, and uh, that's the case at that time in France, and and you know that we have in Europe in general, and particularly in France and in Spain. Uh, a, a second wing a second wave at that time uh, with uh, with a lot of reasons that we we, we can discuss after uh, since uh, the beginning of april so uh, uh, three three weeks uh, after the, the lockdown uh, the, the scientific uh, uh, committee says that uh, uh, it will be necessary to to create a new committee a new citizen committee to have discussion between uh, the, the politician, uh, the scientist, our committee, and uh, a new committee involving uh, citizen, citizen and, and, uh, and different people coming from, uh, uh, from, uh, from different parts of France. Uh, I, I send a letter to, to the prime minister to say it's, it's really a, a major issue to create such a committee, to have a discussion not for what has been done because uh, we, we have an emergency to decide uh, for for the lockdown but uh, what will happen uh, after the lockdown and uh, we say also and uh, it we we were at the beginning of april remember that we we say probably it will be uh, not only one shot for covid 19 but uh, it will be a mid or long-term issue and uh, we we need a discussion with citizens to 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 explore and to to understand uh, what uh, kind of decision would, would be taken uh, at the, at the, at, the, at the social level. And uh, uh, the prime minister say no, it's for us is is not really a priority. So we we discuss with NGOs and uh, we we have a. Uh, we, we make uh, different kind of, uh, of lobbying uh, to, to say it's, it's very important, not probably at, uh, at 8 April or, or May, but uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, September or October. And really, to, uh, now I, I, I said that we, we are right at that time when we discuss about such, uh, such an issue. So finally, no uh, citizen committee was created by the French government. And I don't really understand why. I think it's a great mistake. And I say it publicly in France that it will be, that it, it is a, a great mistake. Uh, we have probably a, 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 a kind of, a, of response at that time. We, we, we push the, the French government to, to, 
you know, in, in, in France, uh, a lot of things are coming from uh, Paris and uh, are, are coming in, uh, in, 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 in the different region of France. And uh, we, we have a different situation uh, in, in different uh, parts of France, uh, in different uh, big cities in France. And uh, uh, we have an heterogeneity of, uh, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the virus circulation, for example. And uh, so the, the crisis is not exactly the same in, the, in all big cities. And we say we have to discuss with, uh, at, the, at the level of uh, regional uh, regional people and regional uh, uh, regional stakeholders. So, so uh, finally, I think that the, the citizen consultation and the citizen place will took a place not at the national level, but at the at the regional level. And uh, uh, you know, for for us, uh, I, I perfectly understood that for kind of a lot of countries, uh, it's uh, it's really. <laughs> Uh, well done and uh, for, for France you know uh, a lot of things are coming from Paris and uh, uh, are centralized uh, but uh, clearly I think that the response now is not at the national level but at the regional level so Thanks. some big cities as uh, Strasbourg, Lyon, Bordeaux uh, are, uh, are involved uh, in the creation of uh, such a committee uh, involving citizens in the, in the decision uh, that are taken at the at the uh, uh, regional level, and I think that uh, it will be finally a good response. So uh, I finish with that. Uh, it's a really a contrast for me. As president of the CCNE, we have a great success uh, with a general consultation and a general citizen consultation uh, on uh, on the ethical issue and uh, the biotechnical law and uh, with the. Uh, really a very nice process and uh, for COVID-19 uh, after you know probably the response will be will be done only after nine months and uh, not at the national level but at the regional level. Jean-Francois thank you so much I think this is really a very important insight I thank you for being so frank actually and also sharing this experience because we all know that on one hand side you had made Great, great step forwards in France in terms of citizen consultation. But now exactly in this crisis, not so much is happening from the national level. I've seen other countries, you know, where people said earlier today, the governments are talking to the people and not with the people. In some countries, actually, I see that governments are talking, national governments are talking to regional government, <laughs> governments and not talking to the people at all or not adequately. I'm glad to hear that a lot of activity is now coming from the bottom up, that there are activities in the, in the municipalities, but we also need to talk about the context, you know, which facilitate actually this collaboration. And I think that the central level will always have a role in this, but we leave this uh, for the discussion. And um, I would now like to invite Ivani and again, uh, please have a look at her CV. I just want to uh, say two things. Number one, you're a little bit like Natasha Atsapardi because um, I see that you are also working in a governance, government institution. You are director of the French National Institute for Health Data. And at the same time, you are a civil society leader. You have actually founded a civil society organization called Renalu which uh, represents patients with renal diseases. And um, uh, Ivani, there are plenty of things to say about, but you have heard the presentations of Deepa and uh, the other speakers. Um, please share with us a little bit about the difficulties such patients um, are facing now during the pandemic, because I think that is very, very specific. And um, also, um, how do you evaluate collaboration with decision makers. I think you are also working very closely on this interface between civil society and governments and institutions. And you know it from both sides. So please, Ivani, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Um, I will speak as uh, the founder of uh, Renalu, which is a, a French kidney patient uh, uh, organization. Um, as patients with a chronic kidney disease, uh, we, we were immediately identified as a vulnerable group by uh, our health authorities. 
and uh, encouraged to apply strict isolation measures. Uh, usually, we are a group that is closely monitored due to our disease. Uh, the situation changed when uh, COVID-19 uh, hit in. Uh, despite the wide availability of modern communication tools, patient-centered contact was and still is erratic. Until now, 1.5% of kidney patients, uh, kidney transplant recipients, and 4.4% of dialysis patients have been diagnosed with COVID-19. We have uh, seen a particular high mortality rate around 20 to 25%. More than 2,000 dialysis patients were infected and more than 400 died. And cases are increasing again. At the beginning of the pandemic in March, uh, when the virus hit Paris and Ile-de-France, uh, many patients reported to us that uh, they had no masks for the dialysis sessions, despite the recommendations. This led to uh, the unfortunate effect that uh, so in some centers, the virus could easily spread. One of the first dialysis doctors who alerted us was uh, from a center at about one hour drive from Paris. He told us about the spread of the virus among his patients and asked for our, our help to warn uh, the health administration. We informed them and the mask arrived a few days later. But it was too late. In total, 37 of his patients had been infected and 11 died. He himself contracted COVID-19 and he was hospitalized in ICU for several weeks. Uh, he will need months to recover. Many similar situations have been reported. To prevent them, drastic protective measures have been put in place in dialysis centers. One of the most difficult and most contested measures has been the ban on eating and drinking during the sessions. This decision was made to ensure that dialysis patients would not remove their masks during the entire dialysis session. In practice, it meant from the moment they left home and returned. This easily could accumulate up to seven to eight hours in total with no eating on drink or drinking. Uh, let us remind us, uh, dialysis is a grueling, exhausting treatment for very fragile patients. Nearly half of them are diabetic. Uh, three quarters of them suffer from malnutrition, malnutrition uh, which has a direct effect on survival. They told us they were starving. Some of them reported fainting and hypoglycemia. Some centers, but not all, have reinstated uh, meals after the end of the lockdown and during the summer months. But most have started again to introduce bans as the epidemic rebounds without taking into account the protest of patients and patient association. Beyond the medical dimension, the ban on meals had a negative effect on their, on their quality of life. And we need to ask us the question of uh, human rights and dignity. It raises ethical questions about what can be imposed on the most vulnerable. Certainly, it is important to be precautious, but under what circumstances? Another contested decision was the global suspension of kidney transplantation due to the crisis. It was decided by the Transplant Doctors Society on March 15th. Strikingly, we were not consulted. None of the several kidney <coughs> patients associations were involved in the decision making progress, making process. Many patients on the renal transplant waiting list were not even informed. Later on, when kidney transplantation was resumed, we were surprised that the medical community had not reached a clear common position. Some hospitals resumed services and others did not. Despite our repeated requests, uh, they refused again to involve us, patient associations, in the decision of when and how transplantation should restart. The ban on, of kidney transplant lasted for two months and had serious consequences. A comparison with the activity from previous years in France suggests that around, around 600 kidneys from deceased donors got lost. For some patients, the delay has been highly, highly prejudicial. Highly prejudicial. None of these men and women are counted as victims of COVID-19, but they are victims of this pandemic too. For a moment, we thought that the urgency of the crisis would allow a strong alliance between patients and professionals to stand together. 
However, that was not the case. On the contrary, sometimes absurd decisions were imposed with a refusal of dialogue and even an explanation. The epidemic has become an alibi for abuse of medical power. Our relations with the public authorities have also been difficult. On the majority of uh, uh, crisis management topics, we were largely set aside. Health democracy has been shattered. Overnight, we were no longer asked for our opinions. It was as, as if we no longer existed. To give you uh, one example, in late April, at the end of the lockdown, we worked on a lot on, of questions around how we can avoid that uh, vulnerable people are unfairly excluded, excluded from the public space, what we can do to avoid exclusion and discrimination. We published a list of 20 proposals. Unfortunately, they were not taken up by public authorities. Five months later, most of these risks that we have highlighted have, have come true. Today, fragile young people are completely invisible. Nothing is planned anymore for them to access to transport, shops, cultural events, and public spaces. They have no choice but to completely isolate themselves. Moreover, it has also become the only option which is perceived as responsible by our society without, without questioning short or long-term consequences due to isolation. In addition, the compensation that allowed vulnerable workers to isolate themselves was removed for most of them on September 1st, forcing them to return to their workspace despite the epidemic rebound. There okay. are the forgotten one ones of the crisis. Please. Um, I'm nearly finished. Uh, we have the feeling that uh, the more time passes, the more the situation deteriorates, both for vulnerable people and for our health democracy. We are not more consulted or listened than uh, in spring. Even worse, it is no longer rare to hear in the media that, in the end, saving the economy and the freedom of young people is well worth the sacrifice of the most vulnerable. We are very worried about what the weeks and months ahead will hold. Ivani, thank you so much. And I think uh, your presentation made very clear health democracy, civil society engagement is not an add-on, it's not a nice to have. It is really essential for the lives of uh, people and uh, in, 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 in the community. And uh, it's negligent not to really in, include them. And I now can fully understand the frustration actually of um, Jean-Francois, you know, that um, even at that level, um, the inclusion of um, civil society organizations and uh, citizens wouldn't, uh, wouldn't uh, function. And, you know, from your presentation, I also uh, clearly understand why some people call the COVID-19 crisis not a pandemic, but a syndemic because it's not just the virus coming over us, but it's also a virus coming over our system and our democracy. And I think uh, in some corners of our democracies, we are not really prepared to um, fight this. And I think governments have been very quick, and I think rightly so, to use emergency powers, you know, emergency law, emergency policy to have more executive power. But those governments which have forgotten to include the, the patients, the citizens, the vulnerable groups, I think uh, that, is, that is very problematic. I th thank you so much. I think in contrast, or in contrast, in conjunction with the presentation of Jean-Francois, I think it gave me a very, very clear, clear picture on, on France at the moment. And uh, we have to rush on um, because uh, time is a, a very pressing issue now. And we come to um, Enric Barros, and again, um, unbelievable CV that lends itself probably to um, uh, <laughs> a novel or something. Um, so, uh, Enrique, you will talk about the um, Health Council, the National Health Council, which was um, founded in 2017 and includes like 30 seats for civil society organization. And um, we would like you to fill us in on the role of this National Health Council in the COVID-19 response and uh, how you personally would actually evaluate this this response and the uh, role of the health council in this please the floor is all yours maximum eight minutes i will give you um, a shout when we are running out of time 
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to present a reflection on the Portuguese journey to a more democratic and transparent participation of society in health-related decision-making, in particular from the perspective of the National Health Council, as you said, is a 36 um, body with a, a relatively nice uh, representation of civil society. You know, before the first cases of SARS-CoV-2 infection were identified in Portugal, what happened the, the, second, of, uh, the second of March, um, people were already facing doubts and fears. They were fueled by news that flooded in the media and the fear of deteriorating health, social and economic conditions was real. Uh, but uh, and this made this was particularly evident among those living with chronic conditions, uh, and obviously more dependent on the performance of the national health service. So at the level of the council, we were discussing how the country was prepared and how people could help to to shape the this set, the response. You know the, the set of measures taken by the government, in fact, without listening to to uh, consulting bodies, but. Uh, the reorganization of the National Health Service, the response uh, and implementation of policies to res restrict mobility and contacts um, was clearly marked by, a, was driven by the response of society, which not only accepted, but at uh, some moments even anticipated the rules. For instance, school closure in Portugal was mainly decided by people before uh, there was a governmental decision. And it contributed to the Portuguese outcome indicators that were viewed as suggestive of an adequate response, at least in the initial phase of the epidemic. There was also a, a very interesting uh, uh, aspect, the, the obligation of professionals, the functional reorganization, the use of uh, available digital platforms, and all these allowed it, uh, the, this response and, and avoided uh, the need for uh, things like selected patients to have access to ventilators, as reported in other countries. And in fact, all these boosted citizen confidence and make to a certain extent, um, uh, and brought to a certain extent to a second plan, their real participation. But the COVID-19 epidemic also brought to light weaknesses in the Portuguese health system. And uh, some were already new and some were clearly identified as we are facing the challenges of these recent months. Um, the national health system, other institutions of the country, but especially civil society, were not prepared to face such a public health emergency. Uh, several years of lack of investment, um, debudgeting, limited financial means, the equipment, human resources, and uh, and even the question of the capacity to respond to the epidemic, and uh, and the role, the the increasing um, importance of a role for civil society was uh, was shaken by by this uh, emergency, uh, and and. The, Obviously, because uh, there were inequalities in access to health care, there were structural and organizational deficits, and especially um, it, it became very obvious the differences between geographical regions and socioeconomic conditions. So inequality, a problem in Portugal, became even more evident. And the, the challenge was how could civil society try to help to, to, to respond to this? Because there is a clear... Uh, prevalent illiteracy in terms of prevention and health promotion. There is a, a burden, important burden of physical and mental illness, an aging population, the inequalities as, a, as I referred before, and it make um, an important fraction of the population especially vulnerable to the biological, the psychological, and especially social impacts of COVID-19. And they were very dependent on, on measures implemented to control it. And in fact, which was uh, their role, how, how present they were. Unfortunately, they were not much present uh, in the in the in discussion. There were some very important uh, uh, movements. Early in March, the Portuguese government issued a, a diploma that established that immigrants and asylum seekers with pending residency applications were considered as regular citizens in the country, which was very important to to overcome uh, obvious. Um, obvious uh, vulnerabilities, but the, the, the response was mainly centralized, uh, even comprising risk communication. There was a clear um, technical command line, very hierarchical structure based in the idea that uh, a technical strong self-sufficiency could make the response, leaving not much room for outside for community 
participation. So there was a clear expert-centered traditional role. So if you want all solutions for new problems and contexts, particularly the increasing importance of social media, um, that was the way the community could make their voices uh, heard but with the problems, all the problems that this brings. Uh, the organizations representing patients and consumers' interests were proactive to obtain responses. They reorganized their activities, focused ma on maintaining contact with their members and people using the, the, um, the services they provide that are very, very, very important um, in the health, uh, in the, as part of the health response in the country. In many cases, they cre they, they're creating uh, contact and support from lines. They reinvented themselves to define and implement new responses. To, to ensure the defense of rights and interests of their members, as well as the support and services provided. Uh, many of these organizations tried to actively contribute to meetings with the Ministry of Health, General Health Directorate, and they began to, they want to be real health actors, but in fact, uh, we are still struggling with that. It's their presence, uh, they weren't, and able to have their voice really heard and made their contributions. One more minute. Reach uh, decision, decision makers. So um, we need, we still need that there is a transformation that they are not anymore just recipients of healthcare, but they are a part of solutions. And uh, as as uh, the work goes in the National Health Council, there was an advice, advice to strongly advised the government to establish mechanisms for real and effective participation uh, in health involving the citizens in the identification of needs and expectations. And this is um, should bring us to a very formal consultation procedure, explicitly and transparent in the implementation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ricardo. And again, a very fascinating account. Also, I quite liked, as you mentioned in the beginning, that actually the government was picking up things or the council was picking up things which were already happening in the communities. And then there was more formal um, participation. But I also very much thank you for short sharing the limitations and the struggles you currently see. But as I understand from your account, you don't give up and you are willing to to use um, the deepest uh, words, you're willing to uh, further invest and uh, take the long road. Um, you already worked on it for a couple of years and it will be probably uh, more years to come to improve um, participation in Portugal. We are coming now to the other side of um, this uh, linkage between government and uh, civil society. And I would like to invite um, Ricardo Fernandez. Ricardo is working in HIV uh, field for, for decades. And I think that uh, civil society organization in this um, area, especially in uh, some parts of Europe, is very, very strong, actually, and uh, has already quite some, uh, some history. And um, I think you, today you are representing GUT Portugal, an organization which, uh, uh, for people living with HIV, hepatitis, and uh, tuberculosis, and um, I, I, would, I would actually like to ask you just with regards to the main challenges you as civil society are currently facing in the COVID-19 uh, crisis and how, from your perspective, the collaboration with decision makers, the governments, and maybe also the council is actually working. Ricardo, again, I will tell you a minute before your time budget runs out because we are a little bit behind. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matthias, and thank you for uh, the invitation to be here representing civil society and talking about all the issues that we have experienced during these very hard times of uh, COVID-19. As we have told, I'm representing a, a, a civil society organization. We are a community-based organization, a patient organization for people living with HIV, uh, with hep virus hepatitis, tuberculosis, and also representing people that are more vulnerable to this uh, uh, infections, migrants, uh, sex workers, people using drugs, uh, uh, um, men having sex with men. So uh, it's really uh, uh, the, 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 the most vulnerable populations, not only to uh, these infections, this is what we are focused, but as well 
uh, uh, um, towards any <laughs> disease, which was the case uh, during the COVID uh, crisis and still uh, now. So I'm here to, to talk uh, about the, the, the experience of a, a, an organization that was very strongly in the field uh, before and uh, try and during the, 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 the lockdown and until uh, today. We have worked during the last few years uh, uh, trying to enhance the, 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 the public participation in health decisions in, uh, uh, for uh, people with or without disease. Uh, we've managed to pass a law in the last uh, year, 8 September, in the parliament that uh, allows uh, uh, the participation at several levels uh, in, 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 uh, in decisions. Uh, uh, however, this law still needs to be regulated and implemented in Portugal. And unfortunately, that happened, uh, it was supposed to happen during the lockdown. So uh, no time to implement this. As Professor Barros, with whom we work a lot and is uh, uh, someone very near to the community, although is uh, 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 in the academic, uh, uh, is also a very uh, uh, community-friendly uh, researcher. Um, uh, this uh, uh, crisis exposed all the fragilities of the system uh, uh, that were increased by the, 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 the social and economical crisis that we had uh, uh, during the last years in Europe and in Portugal specifically. So all the, the, the government was a little was overwhelmed uh, during lockdown. So they were really taking decisions as Professor Barros was mentioning. Uh, uh, and uh, it was very difficult to have communication channels uh, to uh, uh, make our voice to be heard, uh, which was not the case before uh, 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 COVID-19 lockdown. Although we didn't have uh, specific channels uh, that were uh, 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 formal, uh, which we hope we will have in the future, uh, we always... Uh, uh, manage to have channels of communication and this time and this I think it's a point that uh, uh, it's a good argument for the fact that we need formal channels and we, we be we need transparency on how decision making is done and how we are engaged and involved in this decision uh, uh, making so uh, uh, I think that uh, 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 this this image that I I, I, I choose it's uh, I don't know if it, it can be uh, well seen. It's an image of uh, a colleague of mine in a, in a, in the, in a field in Lisbon during lockdown. Uh, what uh, is she's doing? She's searching for people that use drugs in the middle of a field uh, because this is the, the the outreach team of the consumption room in Lisbon that is uh, uh, run with with the, the, the with the partnership of doctors of the world and also the city hall. And we were trying during the lockdown with, without any kind of support from the Minister of Health or even the City Hall to maintain the, 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 this response, this important response for people using drugs open, which is a, 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 a harm reduction response. And also a lot of social issues are dealt during these this, 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 uh, outreach interventions. So she was in the middle of the field searching for people because people weren't, weren't allowed to uh, uh, come to, uh, uh, they were hearing about uh, how they need to, to stay alone and they didn't uh, uh, contact other people. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the, the fourth of a team without materials, protection materials that were only delivered a few weeks ago uh, from the government side, so we need to purchase them at a very high price without any kind of support. Uh, since the very beginning of the epidemic, uh, we got, and we were not the only, we proposed to the Minister of Health that civil society outreach facilities and uh, health train human resources help in the COVID issue to, tr to, to, to make COVID tests to help to, 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 to in health issues related not only with COVID, but also with other underlying underlying. Uh, One more diseases. minute, Ricardo. We don't have an answer, an answer to, 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 to till today about what are, uh, about if they want our support or not to, to help them. I just wanted to, uh, in this minute, to talk a little bit about the, the main problems uh, of, 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 of this pandemic. Um, 
people, uh, migrants, migrants, they were living in, conf in confined spaces that they share with a lot of other peoples, which make them more vulnerable to COVID-19. Nothing was done. Uh, migrant communities, they are so very, very, uh, 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 they have tenuous or informal employment links. And during COVID, they were in unemployment, leaving them in a precarious economic condition. This, although migrants were instantly legal, as Professor Bajo said, they were not protected against this. Health systems exclude migrants usually, so they were even more excluded during this, this time. Um, and the health system was organized as a binomial, which was COVID patients and non-COVID patients. So people with other disease were not really being hurt. Uh, many of the groups uh, uh, many of the people of these groups have other vulnerabil vulnerabilities. They are not just, they don't have just one vulnerability. They are sex workers, that are, they are using drugs, they are migrants. So this put them more at risk. So all this social precariousness created by this economic crisis affects primarily these groups, not, not allowing them to assess basic things such as accommodation, food, medicines, transports, materials to prevent and protect them against COVID. So we need to be heard the next time. We need to have tools to uh, help in this decision-making around health. Thank you so much. And uh, very important that we really see um, civil society engagement is there for these vulnerable groups, you know, that otherwise don't have really a voice. And um, you were asking actually for particular formal channels to raise this voice, to make yourself heard, even though I think it's not so bad in Portugal and probably the government was well meant, but you said government was also overwhelmed and probably this is again a consequences of years and years trying to streamline government and making ministries smaller. I mean, who's going to respond if you have a very streamlined, very small, small um, government? You were also talking about maintaining outreach facilities. And yes, I want to thank all of the presenters that they have sticked to Deepa's fourth lesson. Let's be transparent because very clearly you shared very frank and sometimes gruesome experiences, you know, in your country, how vulnerable groups, how civil society is hurt or not hurt. And um, I think that was very, very important. And I can figure that the Twitter has exploded. But before I ask Twitter, uh, Kira to uh, feed us in and feed back to the panel questions from the from the chat box, I would like to go with you quickly through the poll. So the first question was actually, who do you re represent? And it's relatively balanced between government, academia, and civil society, but the private sector doesn't seem to pay a lot of interest. The second question was, in your country, has civil society been involved in the government-led COVID-19? And only 12% say yes, close collaboration, and I think that Uh, resembles a little bit the picture we have heard today from our um, presenters. Third question is, in your country, has civil society been represented on scientific task force committees to advise government on the COVID-19 response and clearly very much underrepresented? Only 10% say yes, 52% they know. I think this is a huge gap which we cannot afford in the future. Number four, in your country, has collaboration between civil society and the government increased over the course of COVID-19? And unfortunately, some countries have not learned. 53% they say no, and only 8% have a very clear yes. So I think we really need to draw lessons from this and uh, change the course of interaction. And the last question, in your view, Is the COVID-19 crisis a moment for change to help amplify people's voice in health decision-making? And I think the, the real majority of you in the audience really think that is the case. And I think we've heard from Thailand, from uh, Spain and from Portugal, very good arguments, very concrete, um, that this has to change and that health democracy needs to be strengthened. Kira, the floor is all yours. Wonderful, Matthias, and thank you everybody for participating. We have seen a very active uh, Q&A chat, and I've seen a lot of responses already from Deeper, so please have a look as well 
on all those answers that we have received so far. Interesting, I would like to pick up some key words actually that came to, that I have reading it is out of the box thinking, changing the default mode of governments, disrupt ground thinking. This crisis really makes neglected topics more obvious and it can be a catalytic converter. So I think those words are already quite telling us that this is really a, a chat where we have to really understand and maybe challenge ourselves as well to think differently. What I can see as well in our discussion that social participation really can also help to move ourselves forward when it comes to advancing the agenda on uh, the gender uh, debate uh, and it was also very much appreciated that there was a uh, emphasis on the experiential knowledge that Deepa has mentioned, and I think that is a very valid point. Um, we have also seen some questions in terms of whether on WHO side, actually, we have any active mechanisms to engage with civil society. And yes, uh, we have seen with our Director General, Dr. Tetra, that there has been a push in order to uh, include more the voices of civil society. And actually, I would like to invite you for everybody who's interested uh, to check out the civil society engagement mechanisms of UG 2030. It's under csemonline.net, which is the mechanism that has been put in place a couple of years back, and they've been active in the field of universal health coverage. So I can just motivate everybody to look into that um, and get involved, of course. Um, let me now feed back some questions to our panelists. Um, they have been quite an active in uh, discussion and uh, a particular interest in Portugal. So please, Enrique and uh, Ricardo, there are two questions for you. Um, taking that understanding uh, of moving the mountains uh, in Portugal, is there present civil society which is key to enforce pace and more effective measures? Maybe you can reflect a little bit more on that. And then there was a particular question on the function Personalities and funding mechanisms actually of the National Health Council in Portugal because we have uh, some uh, Maltese attendees uh, with us today and they are actually very much interested in setting up a similar mechanism and so uh, please uh, let's have some peer-to-peer -peer exchange and I think that would be much appreciated. To our Thai and France colleagues, I would like to rather have an open question to all of you and this came uh, from a attendant, Tessa Richard, who was asking in the chat box on how has civil society who has been actually involved was able to change policies and its implementation and in your opinion do public or patient right charters have a role to play in ensuring public and patient involvement in policy decision making so maybe let me stop here and uh, let's feed it back to our panelists. I would start with our Portuguese um, panelists, um, Dr. Barros and Ricardo, to start and then go to Thailand and France. Over to you, please. Yeah, so uh, regarding the, 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 the first question, uh, we are engaged, specifically GAT, but there's also other patient organizations that are represented in, in this uh, uh, um, uh, National, Health, uh, National Count, Health Council, and um, we do have uh, 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 influence as the other uh, representatives uh, in making some decisions. I remember that in the beginning of the, 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 the pandemic, the, the outbreak, uh, there was uh, a lot of uh, discussions, inside discussions, and also some decisions that were made with the council of this uh, institution, like uh, if schools should lock down or not. Uh, several decisions were made recurring to the, uh, the, the council of this uh, organism. So I think that uh, uh, this is a really good uh, uh, um, tool, but it's not the only one. We need others, but this is already a good tool. We need to develop others for participation and decision, of course. Regarding the, the other question about the, 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 the law on participation, this was a big effort that was made uh, by GAT. We, uh, uh, we started an initiative with other uh, uh, patient organizations uh, uh, in Portugal 
and we did a lot of advocacy. Uh, we did a document with what was what were our requests, what we did have to see, and the framework for participation. And we uh, uh, passed him in the, in the, in the last uh, September, uh, in the in the last year, a year now, in the, the Parliament. Now we need, uh, and this is a public document. Now we need to uh, to have the implementation of this law because it's still only a law, and the state, the government needs to say what are the resources and what are the places where uh, decision making participation uh, will take place. So we still need all this process, and unfortunately, this wasn't done before COVID nineteen. So we didn't have these tools during this crisis, unfortunately. But we hope that in the future we'll have more 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 uh, more tools. Uh, because of this law. Well, if I can add something, uh, the National Health Council in Portugal is a governmental uh, organization in the sense that uh, um, it's council in the government. But uh, for uh, if you take the WHO definition of civil society, almost one third of the seats uh, belong to civil society. And in a special case of uh, of patient organizations or um, they, 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 their representatives are elected among all those uh, that exist in the country. So there is a, um, uh, there is this uh, democratic uh, way of choosing who is there. Um, a major, a major concern is in fact uh, funding and funding mechanisms. The, in, in fact, it's uh, um, it's uh, slowly changing. Um, we expect that the 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 National Health Council can behave as a sort of a, uh, a, a kind of a think tank in the sense that uh, many different many different voices are presented there, and they can think about uh, the the problems and solutions and propose uh, propose solutions. And we are very happy, although it was late, uh, already seven months is in the in the pandemic. The 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 plan for for uh, for responding to the to the what we expected to be these uh, fall winter um, uh, challenges in uh, in uh, in health relating to COVID nineteen and respiratory infections was formally presented to the council and the council was asked to make uh, to make comments uh, uh, improvements uh, criticisms and we expect it will be it will be um, present in the final document and in final decision so. I think we are away, far away from the ideal, but we would be. But I think we are in the right, uh, in the right. Uh, we need to move on. But we also heard from France because there was this very important uh, question from Tessa Richards on the impact, you know, uh, on the use of various instruments. Jean-François, would you like to start? Um, yeah. No, I, I want to say that uh, again. Um, I, I think it's really important to have a. Uh, um, a new object and, uh, for, for citizen consultation in such crisis. Uh, it's, we, we have to distinguish, I think, also between uh, the, the citizen consultation and uh, representativity and uh, uh, association and uh, representative of, uh, of patients. You know, Renaldo has, uh, has presented a uh, very well documented uh, a question about uh, hemo hemodialysis patient and uh, and uh, and transplantation in France. Uh, however, the, the problem is not only for hemodialysis patients; it is not is also for for older patients in general. And uh, for, for example, the question at that time in France is what we are what we want to do. We, we know that uh, uh, ninety percent of uh, of death uh, during the first phase uh, occur in a patient older than uh, uh, 65 years old and uh, uh, what we want to do between uh, uh, the young the younger population uh, we clearly is a, is a major issue for uh, the virus replication at that time but uh, we we need also that we we, we want to to live with with the virus and uh, how to decide what we want to do with uh, uh, the most vulnerable population due to the age or, or uh, different pathology. And uh, I think for this question, you know, it's, it's not only a, a question for physicians, it's a question also for 
uh, for every citizen. And for this question, we need uh, some uh, some issue and some discussion with a global citizen council. And uh, clearly, we need that in France at that time. Jean-François, many, many thanks. We could go on like this for quite a time because all you guys, you have so much experience and so much to tell. I think this is uh, rather a teaser than a concluding uh, session. But we now have one more speaker, actually, and I'm very happy. I'm very happy to announce uh, Agnès Sukar, Director of Health Systems and Governance and Financing, WHO headquarters. So when it comes to government, and uh, we were also discussing funding, actually, these instruments, then I think Agnès is really the right uh, person to talk to. And uh, we are really looking forward to your contribution. Agnès, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, and thanks for uh, organizing uh, this session and, and uh, providing us with the insights uh, that are so interesting from uh, Thailand, Portugal, France. And uh, as, a, as a French citizen, I was actually very impressed by uh, the combined presentation and the lively debate that is taking place uh, right now. As we today uh, stand here together, in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis, we can really pause and reflect on how this crisis has revealed the blind spots of global health um, that are now painfully uh, uh, exposed uh, during the crisis. And when we met in September 29 uh, at the UN General Assembly and, and together and all the countries signed a political declaration on, on UHC, there was really a sense of hope and a sense of optimism as we were following globally a, a, a positive uh, trajectory towards the SDG. And yet COVID-19 happened and this is uh, no longer given that we are in a positive trajectory. And the key question is, why is it that, what is it that we uh, did not pay attention to? And, and, and critically, for sure, what we see is that the crisis exposes how little we have invested in, um, in core common goods for health. The public goods, um, the, the, the functions, the core public health functions. Uh, that governments need to support because they are very broad market failures. And um, those core public health functions, the surveillance, the laboratories, the, the, the animal health, the environmental health, we see that we have underinvested in those. We've underinvested in um, the uh, preparedness uh, uh, activities. And all of these are not delivered by the market and require collective action. And when we talk about collective action and this topic of, of investments in common goods, what brings us together, we talk about building consensus, building a social contract in which we collectively agree to finance health uh, together and not as individuals in, in, in market transactions. But collective action means that we find a common position, that we build uh, that consensus about how together we're going to raise collective financing through taxation and how we're going to use that financing. And that requires that societal dialogue. Um, collective action, investments in public health requires a consensus, require, require a sense of collective identity and uh, uh, bringing together uh, different groups so that they are not special interests that win over, over others, but what we really together work on the commons. And that is really critically important. And we've seen it also during, uh, we see it during this crisis. Because this is what builds trust in society and trust in government and trust in health services. And we see how important that trust is um, in the response to COVID and, and how that dialogue with citizens proves important. And, and, and the three countries have really shown that very, very specifically. So over 
time, what we've seen over, over the past decades of experience with UHC uh, efforts at country level is the building of the social contract um, is, uh, involves uh, health reforms that build on social participation mechanism. And if we want to leave no one behind, then everyone needs to be in the social contract. So as the commitment was made globally, all countries committed to universal health coverage, the only way to go about it is in each and every country to build very strong participatory and transparent multi-stakeholder processes that actually bring that collective decision uh, about. So all three countries have, we've been hearing from today have enlightened us on how this can be done, right? whether it's the Thai National Health Assembly, the France uh, Etat Généraux de la Bioéthique, or the Portugal National Health Councils, we see that it's not a discrete uh, one-time exercise. It is about institutions building. It is about building that ongoing dialogue and making sure that that dialogue is inclusive by using vastly different uh, uh, models and, and processes, uh, whether it is using the new technologies or using more traditional uh, town halls, but what is important is the institutionalization. That means it cannot be done through just uh, uh, a development aid uh, uh, um, driven process or a one time, uh, one disease specific process. It has to be part and parcel of the governance of health system. It has to be part and parcel of a UHC project um, and they need to be resources allocated to this, to this process in terms of supporting that dialogue and its different, uh, its different legs. And I think that's, that's what we hear today because in practice, the how-to of participation can be complex, and the, but the added value is immense. And it has very long-term implications because of the building of social trust and the building of, of, uh, of the social contract, construct. So we see from the panel discussion that this can reap rewards. Regular interactions between government and the public builds this understanding and trustful relationship, which can bear fruit during crisis time. It's not at the time of crisis that we need to build trust. We all know whether it is in a family or with friends, it's the same with a society. Trust takes a long time. It takes uh, a lot of dialogue. It takes a lot of interaction. So this, the, the, this COVID-19 crisis more than ever reminds us of the importance of collective action, the importance of investing in common goods and the importance of trust. And in countries where a participatory culture already exists, it is naturally easier to mobilize actors in a timely manner, especially uh, when this uh, relationships already exist and you can build them uh, uh, upon. So more voice in decision making is not a luxury. It's not the cherry on the cake uh, of a modern health system. It is at the root of, of a collective process. It's at the root of governance. It is about people's voice, people's agency, and every and single uh, citizens to, um, to be aware that they can influence the process or, and that they are part of the, of the national conversation so that at the end, the collective decision is as much theirs as it is owned by, um, by their fellow citizens. Where are we on that? So the, the evidence of the role of uh, democracy in health or voice participation agency in the governance of health system is actually very well established in the literature. What we need to, um, to do now is really move beyond the sort of fragmented, discrete type of interventions in which we built some social participation in some specific programs to actually invest in institutional processes, in invest in institution, get the governance right, and not have social participation as an afterthought or a luxury. It is fundamental as much 
as as fundamental as a health financing framework, as fundamental as investing in the right human resources skill, the, the importance of investing in, um, in societal dialogue, in national health assemblies, in the state general of health, is as uh, the, the level of importance is as high, if not higher, than a specific discussion on financing. Because in fact, the financing discussion of UHC is very much a collective, uh, a collective decision because it is about taxation and it's about the use of the proceeds of taxation. So it is uh, profoundly uh, a, a collective uh, conversation that needs to be structured in a way that feeds into, into a government budget. So obviously it takes time. It does not happen overnight. It does require resources, and that's what we need to say. It's not just something that can be done on a voluntary basis once in a while when we find a bit of money somewhere in a health program. It requires resources, but those resources are not um, uh, very uh, 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 sizable. These are very small resources that are essentially for capacity building and undertaking the dialogue. So it's a very small share of health expenditures, uh, typically much less than 1% of health expenditures. But what is important is that these are predictable resources, that governments have a commitment to, those res to, to, to holding this dialogue and that they realize that holding this dialogue will bring about many more advantages than the potential risk of opening a difficult uh, conversation. So small but predictable resources built in uh, health budgets, building uh, government budgets, domestic budgets, uh, involvement of people in decision making is uh, parts and parcel of the social contract. It's not a development aid issue. It is profoundly a social contract issue and a domestic issue. So we need really to invest in this. It's not too late to start. And this is the only way we will be able to overcome the COVID-19 crisis and, and get us back on a positive trajectory to the SDGs.